I would have to deal with these dreams and deal with these devils and I will cry myself to sleep because like God like this this can't be the reality it can't be this 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 cannot be it I'm trying to live right I'm I'm, I'm I've gave my life to you uh I'm trying my best but when I'm trying, why are these devils coming in? And I just, I was at a point where I was giving up. Like, God, like, I can't do this. This is mentally tormenting and emotionally and physically exhausting. My name is Otis Reynolds. Um, I'm 24. I'm from uh, Birmingham, England. Um, a backstory to how I was actually born. So I have an older sister. She's 27. Well, she's turning 27. I'm turning 25. The funny story about this was that we was actually meant to be uh, five years apart. And uh, the way that it actually happened was my mum planned for my sister to uh, go to private school. And then she planned for me to go to private school. But because there was a, uh, a price that was obviously expensive, my mum wanted us to be five years apart, which clearly didn't happen. And the story behind that was so... My mum was on contraception after she gave birth to my sister. She was on the coil and she was on the pill. That's like double, like you're not getting pregnant. And uh, what happened was she got pregnant and she got pregnant with me. The crazy thing about it was when she went to the hospital, um, they said that you can abort the baby because if I was born with the coil there, then there'll be dangers and there'll be possibilities that I would die because the coil will be in my brain, in my eye, anywhere in my body. So they recommended her to abort me, but she didn't want to abort me. So they told her if she wants the pregnancy to go as smoothly as possible, she has to take out the coil. And when she takes out the coil, there is a chance where she will lose me. Um, but my mom said, you know, let's, let's go ahead and Thankfully, through all the contraception, I'm still here. Um, I shouldn't be, but I am. And it's funny because the reason why I believe that I'm supposed to be here was because shortly after that moment, my dad got sick. And when my dad got sick, he actually eventually died a few years later. And because, you know, he died, if it was their plan and it was five years, I just, I wouldn't be here. So it was like a, yeah. That's a miracle. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So so tell us about growing up in England and, and your life before Jesus. Growing up, my dad was sick. Um, I don't really have a lot of memories with my dad because he died when I was five. Uh, as soon as he passed away, it was just me, my mum, my sister in the house. Um, my grandma also came very involved, which was my dad's mum. And she became like a second mum to me. It was like my mum, my grandma and my sister. Um, when my dad died when I was five, I also was suffering with really bad asthma. Also as a child, there was a lot of underlying seduction, sexual behavior, like kiss chase in nursery. And uh, there would be times where like girlfriends would come to their house when I was five, six, like innocently. But then we would end up just like kissing each other on like our bellies, our faces, little touches. We don't know what we're doing, but um it, it was just going that way. And I think that was the start of when little sexual things started to arise in me for that's the first time I noticed. And I was actually in nursery at the time. And I think after that moment, I think it just really increased. Uh, the sexual things started to increase. I'll never forget, I was on the sofa one time and uh, I sat on the remote control. And as soon as I sat on the remote control, I was about seven years old, porn came on the TV. And I was like, at the time, I was just frozen. I was so frozen. I was looking at the TV, just like glued. And I, I just could not take my eyes off the TV. I was glued. And obviously at that point, you don't know nothing about masturbation. You're just so innocent as a child. But there was something that was drawing to me to the, the TV and the porn. And at that point, so I was like seven, eight. And there'll be times where I would go downstairs, wake up early because I found out what time these channels would come on. And... I would just watch it. My mom never knew. She knows now, but she never knew. And then uh, when uh, it was light time, I would also, uh, when I had a TV in my room, I would find the channel and I would just watch it and I would just stare and I would just stare. I don't know what would happen, but I would just always feel this yearning for it. So I would continue to always watch it growing up and growing up. Around the ages of eight, I went into McDonald's toilets. This is a time I, f I was... Um, nearly raped, um, I believe, or sexually assaulted. Um, I went to McDonald's with my mum. And when I was in McDonald's, I wanted to go to the toilet. So I went to the toilet, mum waited outside and I was, you know, I went in. 
And I'll never forget, I'd done what I needed to do. And as I was coming out, uh, two men came in and um, they, they kind of pushed me back into the bathroom. And when they pushed me back into the bathroom, the one guy was like, well, where are you going? What, what are you doing? Where are you going? And I was just scared. I was just frozen, like, like legit just frozen um, because I was a kid. And these were like grown men. I never forget the one started to put his hand like on my neck and just started to like touch me. And I was just stuck, frozen, fear. And then the guy said, come on, let's do it. So the other guy said, come on, let's, let's do it, let's do it. And then when he was about to put me into the cubicle, the one man said, no, like, don't do it to him. Like, stop. And the guy's like, why? Like, we've got him. He's right here. Like, this is what we're supposed to do. And the guy was like, I, I don't know what it is, but there's something about him. We're not supposed to touch this one. I don't know what it is, but just don't touch him. So the other guy looked at the guy like, like, are you okay? Like, we've, we've got him. Like, but eventually he, he let me out. He let me go. He let me out. And I walked straight to my mom and I just sat down and I was just frozen. And I didn't say a word to my mom because growing up without a dad, you have to learn as a boy how to become a man because you have no male influences. So I really had to learn, okay, God, I wasn't even God at the time. Yes, I was going to church, but as a kid, it's like, okay, man, like, I don't want to worry my mom. I don't want to worry my grandma. I don't want to worry my sister. There was areas of me that I had to mature quickly and I had to learn how to become a man. So whatever happened to me, I just never told anybody. I just went through it and I guess I just had to deal with it by myself. And every time I went to back to the toilets, I was always scared and because I thought two men were going to come in or another man's going to come in. And yeah, that was, that was interesting. When I was around 10, 11, I was touched, molested um, by my, um, one of my aunties on my grandma's dad's side. I used to go over to their house for study, tutoring for school. I never forget the girl, my auntie, she came out. She said, let's play a game, let's play a game. I'm like, all right, cool, let's, let's play a game. I love games. I was an energetic kid, loved to have fun, play games. She was like, if you don't answer this question right, then I get to kiss you. And if you don't answer it right the second time, I get to kiss you for longer. So I'm like, okay, all right, cool. I don't know any better. She then does the very thing. She comes and she kisses me because I got the question wrong. I don't know if she kissed me. I remember just like freezing and thinking, wow, this is, this is strange. This, is, this, is, this doesn't feel natural. This doesn't feel normal. And then she goes, well, let's play again. And then she's asking me questions that I, there's no way that I'm going to get this right. And again, from the one kiss, 10 to 10 seconds to 20 seconds, and then ended up her touching me and touching body parts. And at that point, it was like, I, I need to go. So I remember um, I left that scene at that moment. But then there was another time where I was going to the fridge and this one always, I don't know, this one always brings back some kind of emotion. But I remember I was going to the fridge and when I was going to the fridge, I was going to get some orange juice and I took out the bottle and I turned around and she was just there. And the fridge was in like a corner. So she could put her arms like that and I'm like trapped in the middle. And I remember she put her arms like that and she says, you're not going anywhere. And then she tries to like, just like kiss my neck and just really touch me. And I was fighting for my life, but she was big and she was strong and she was just older and taller. I just couldn't get out. Eventually I found a gap between her arm and her leg and I just jumped through the gap and I ran to the back garden because I didn't know what else to do. This, the whole sexual stuff really opened up from a, from a young age and then going into my teenage, same thing. But obviously as a teenager, you learn about sex education and then you hear other people's thoughts about sex. And yeah, the whole sexual thing really opened up to me when I was a teenager, especially going to high school. And and I know you said you didn't mention this to to your mom, but between high school and being little, did you ever speak about this with anybody? No, I no, I was not telling anybody about this because when those things happen, you start to blame yourself, and you don't know why you blame yourself. You just think I was a part of it. I done something wrong, so I I was I was never going to say it because I thought I was going to get in trouble. I also thought that if I tell her, my mom would probably kill her. So I was like, I need to do the best that I can to protect myself and protect my family. And I thought the best way to do that was silence. And that silence, I guess, just 
brought more of an appetite, brought more of a bit of shame, made me start to suppress my actual emotions and start to uh, pretend my feelings are full of my mom and my sister, hmm. um, just so to make sure that they was okay. So, At what age did you come to surrender your life to Jesus? I was 18. I was 18. And how old are you right now? I'm 24, turning 25. Talk to us about that time hmm. in between there from, okay, experiencing all of this in your childhood to now becoming uh, uh, in your teens and then surrendering your life to the Lord. What happened there? So as soon as I went to high school, in England we say secondary school, um, that was just like sexual culture just came out. That's where the uh, I got addicted to masturbation. And I'll never forget the story. There was a boy, um, there was a boy that came up to me and he was talking about ejaculation, obviously saying other terms, but he was talking about ejaculation. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Like I was so innocent. I had no idea what he was talking about. And he told me, well, you know, if you want to see it, when you go home, go lie down on your bed, do this to yourself and you'll see what I'm talking about. So... What did I do? I went home, I would lie down on the bed and it happened. And then I got addicted. The feeling just, over I'll never forget the first time I did it. The feeling felt like it overcame my whole body. And I thought, whoa, like I need to do that again. And for my teenage years, it became uh, masturbating every day to three times a day to four times a day. Masturbation really uh, took off. As the masturbation took off, uh, obviously I lost my virginity. And when I lost my virginity, the sex took off. I was just having sex uh, a lot of places, um, a lot of the time. It was just a, it was just a lot of sexual activity for all the teenage years. And I guess then growing up, growing up without a dad in high school and seeing Father's Day and everyone's dad came to their football games and everyone's dad came to their sports days. And I never had that. You know, it, it produced like an anger. It produced this level of rejection. It produced this level of, um, I don't belong. So every time that Father's Day come up or any time that a feeling would try and come that would remind me of not having a dad or I guess rejection. I used to fight in school, I used to fight for the fun. I used to mess around the class clown. I felt like I had to perform to prove myself. I never really was validated by a man. I was never validated that you're doing a great job, you're doing well, you're doing good. So my validation came from my peers. It came from everyone saying, you're funny, you're hilarious. And I was rude. Like I made teachers cry. I was just bad in school, but that gave me a level of popularity. And I never had that. I only had that in my sports because I used to be an athlete. So playing football, well, we call it soccer, but playing, um, well, we call it football, you guys call it soccer. That's where I got all my affirmation. But anywhere else, I, I never got it. So coming from that sports background is a performance background. So I performed everywhere I went. I performed at uh, school, I performed at home, I performed with my friends. So that teenage years just brought out a lot of emotions, a lot of um, rejection, a lot of anger, rage at points and a lot of sex. So that was teenage years. So now we fast forward to when I'm 18. Now when I'm 18, um, at this point, I was playing for uh, a team called Birmingham City in England. I was in the development squad. So Birmingham City is a professional team and they have categories. And my category that I was in was the development squad at the time. I remember my time was up, uh, I was 18. And I felt this call on my heart. I felt this, like the best way I could describe it was like some, something is calling me. I believed it was God because growing up, my mom did bring my sister and myself to church. So I really did believe it was God calling me, but I didn't know. So I thought, let me try it out. I went to church after church after church and nothing was happening, nothing whatsoever. And I thought, God, I, I feel like this is you. You know, I'm out here clubbing, I'm out here sexing, I'm out here drinking. Um, um, there was an area in my teenage that uh, sold a little bit of drugs on the side. But I felt this call. I felt this call and I was going to churches and nothing, just nothing. And I left deflated. And then I got myself a job and I worked at Nando's and uh, there was this girl that was there. She was a very beautiful girl. And when I saw this girl, my intentions were, you know, you are a fine girl. Let me, let's go into that area of sex and whatever. What happened was when I approached her, she actually was a Christian and she started to tell me that, you know, I go to church and she was giving me no time of the day. But I liked the challenge. I always felt like, you know, I was that guy at, at the time. Um, Oh yeah, so I liked the challenge. I went for it 
And I just, the church persona came, mum, he said, you know, I was, I, I went to church, my mum took me to church, so I know the scriptures a bit. And, you know, I, I tried to play my way and I really did. Um, and again, she wasn't really having it, but she invited me to a church. It was Ruach at the time. Uh, and Bishop John Francis was coming to the service from London. I never forget, walked in, sat on the back row. I remember he was just preaching and I'm there just rocking. I'm just rocking. I feel like he's talking to me like, like, God, this is crazy right now. Everything was like, I felt like everything about my life was being exposed. He then called everybody up. He wanted to touch everybody. And when it was my turn and I came up, he got some oil. Before he put the oil on me, he said that uh, your life's never going to be the same. And he put the oil on my head. And when he put the oil on my head, it's like everything went black. I couldn't see anything. It's like, I felt like my eyes were open, but I couldn't see anything. And in that time, those few seconds of me not seeing anything, I heard a voice so clear. And the voice said, your past is over, now go and live for me. And as soon as I heard that, my eyes opened straight away. And from that moment, I was like, okay, I know God is real. I, I heard that. So from that moment, I felt like that call got satisfied. I said, like, God, I heard you, let's go. The next day, all my friends locked them off. I stopped going to the clubs. I stopped trying to have sex. Two weeks later, I got baptized. And uh, two weeks after that, I, I preached. And it was like a fast motion. It was like a fast track. I guess that's how I got saved. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Talk to us about, about your life after. Because obviously, you still have a lot of things that... Yeah. That the Lord has to, you know, help Lord. you go through. <laughs> yeah. You also have had some encounters and, and you've seen a lot of things in the spiritual realm. And so I want us to go, you know, slowly through it. But let's start after that moment. Yeah. What began to happen? What did be, did you begin to see? What did you begin? What did the Lord begin to do inside of you? Yeah. So I never really saw in the spiritual realm before I was saved. Before I was saved, I always used to have two dreams and the two dreams were the same old dreams. When I was a child growing up, every time I misbehaved, I'd have a dream of these angels walking down this path. And every time I saw these angels, I would run behind a rock and I would hide because I knew that I did something wrong. And the angels would all look at the same time and they would look at me and they'd just shake their head in like sadness. And they would carry on walking down this beautiful path. That was one dream I always used to have. And the, the second dream I always used to have was there was God and there was Satan and it was on this battleground. And on this battleground, there was like millions of people in the middle. On this battleground, Satan morphed himself to look like God. And everyone who had first saw God, when they saw Satan turn into God, they started to run to Satan who looked like God. And I remember I was in the gym saying, everybody, that's not the real God. This is the real God. Like, come on, come on. And I remember in the dream, Satan eventually got the people and swallowed them up. So those were the two dreams I would constantly have before I was saved. But that was the most I saw after getting saved. <sighs> that's when I started to see everything. And that's when fears and different things started to come. Um, I remember as soon as I got saved, it's like my dream life just opened. I started to dream and I used to see demons. I used to see devils. I used to see angels. I used to see a lot of things as soon as I got saved. It was like an instant uh, motion. I remember now when I used to pray, or when I first got saved, I would hear a clap or I'd hear a, a bang every time I'd start to pray and it would freak me out. I'd, I'd I'd open my eyes and it would just scare me and stop me from praying. So now I'm hearing things, I'm seeing things that I never heard or saw before, but I knew that these were demons and devils because I was always um, stopping me from praying and going forward with God. Obviously, as you said, there's certain things that I didn't deal with. As soon as you get saved, you have to go through the process. So masturbation was strong after I got saved. Masturbation was strong. I got saved and I, every night I would still masturbate two, three times a day. And slowly and slowly it would get shorter and shorter. And then what started to happen to me was every time I didn't masturbate, um, a demon would come into my room and pin me down on my bed. It would either come down and pin me down on my bed or I would have a dream of me having sex in the dream and I would ejaculate 
either one way or the other. Now, really quick, just to clarify, when you say a demon would come in mm -hmm. and pin you down, yeah. was this in the physical? This is, this... Yeah, like this was physically. I, I would see this demon come into my room. What did he look like, if you don't mind me the, asking? The, the, the best way I can describe it was like an animal. It looked like a bear. That's the best way I can describe it. It was big, it was tall, and it would come, always come the same route through my door, um, down to the end of my bed, and then it would come over to me on the bed. And it was like I couldn't move. It's like I didn't physically have physical hands pinned me down, but I saw it physically come in. And as it came on top of me, I couldn't move. I was stuck. And I would ejaculate like that, or it would happen in my um, dream. dream. And uh, it was a constant thing. I was trying to start masturbation because I knew that's what God wanted. And I was trying to become a better man in that sense. But at the same time, every time I started masturbating, I would have to deal with these dreams and deal with these devils. And I would cry myself to sleep because like, God, like this, this can't be the reality. It can't be. This, this, this cannot be it. I'm trying to live right. I'm, 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 I've gave my life to you. Uh, I'm trying my best. But when I'm trying, why are these devils coming in? And I just, I was at a point where I was giving up, like, God, like, I can't do this. This is mentally tormenting and emotionally and physically exhausting. I remember I used to call, I called my uh, apostle back in England, Apostle Emmanuel. And uh, I remember I asked him, I said, I'm, I'm trying to stop masturbating and these devils keep coming. And he just kept saying to me the scripture, you know, the Bible says, submit yourself to God, resist the devil and he will flee, like, stay strong. And eventually, after a few more tormenting moments, it, it just stopped. I really submitted myself to that process and it, it stopped. The, ma the, masturbation, the masturbation stopped. It took a few years. It didn't happen straight away. It was a year's process. I was saved. I was, um, you know, rejoicing. I was glorifying God, getting people saved. But then at the same time, me doing that, I was still bound to masturbation and I was still bound to porn. And I started to deal with these devils and these demons. So, um, yeah, that that was like the, the start of when I got saved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did the did the Lord begin to deal with the molestation? Um yeah. obviously there's some forgiveness that has to happen there. Yeah. What did he do in that area? So what's crazy about that area was that um there was a woman, um, she was like a mentor to me, like a mother figure to me. Um, and uh I went to her house and um she prayed for me. And then when she prayed for me, she says, I see some locked doors at the back of your mind, like you've forgotten about them, that some things have happened to you and you don't even remember. Because I generally forgot that I got molested. I had no idea. I put it so far at the back of my mind that I had no idea I was touched. And then um, she was praying for me and she said, I see the Holy Spirit unlocking these doors now. And then she goes, one door's unlocked. And when she said that, a flood of memories started to come back like instantly and I remembered the moments of when I was um, sexually assaulted or molested and touched it all came back to me and I started to cry and I didn't realize and that was the most crazy thing I didn't realize I got molested I didn't I had no idea and how old were you at this time I was 20 21 20 I think I was 20 wow yeah, I had no idea, you know, it happened to me 10, 12 years ago and I had no idea that it happened, but the Holy Spirit brought it back to my remembrance and I just started to really cry. And I think in my tears, pain, you start to feel the pain, the memory of it, the the shame of it, the the, the traumas of it, it all starts to come back. And, you know, it, it, was a, it was a process. After she did that, I thought, man, I haven't even told anyone. So then I had to get through the process of the shame so I could start to tell people. And first I told my apostle and I told him because I know he went through a similar thing. And I was so scared, man. I was so scared to go back to tell him. I didn't know how he was going to look at me. I didn't know what he would say. And even in my mind, I knew he would look at me still in the right way because he's gone through it. But this was the first time that I'm going to tell anyone. And when I told him, you know, he he really loved on me. Like he was just, just like such a great and still is a father figure to me. He really loved on me through it. You know, it wasn't your fault. And I guess that was how I really got over it by me, I guess, sharing it, me praying about it. And yeah. yeah. How did your mom um, react to it or that conversation? Yeah. So uh, I actually only told my mom about that two years ago and uh, she was, she was shocked, um, of course, because she had no idea. She was more like very quiet. I thought she might have been a bit, ah, ah, you know, 
Uh, if I told her back then, she probably would have you know, killed her. But because all these years have happened and she's seen how I've progressed into a man and still progressing into a man, she, she was like, why didn't, why didn't you say anything? I was like, mom, what, what could I say? Like, what, what do you want me to say? Um, I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to protect Olivia. I know what you went through with my dad's death. I know the whole testimony, I know the story. You really suffered. You were broken. How can I tell you, mom, something like that when you are broken? So I, I guess just had to deal with it. And, you know, she was, she was just, uh, I think a bit confused. Um, yeah, she was just a bit confused, but she was she was okay because she sees how I am now, so she was okay. Did you ever have a conversation with with the person who did no, it? No, I've never had a conversation with her. And that's not because I hold bitterness or unforgiveness to her. The last time I seen her was about 12 years ago um, in general. And when it comes to our family, you know, there's, there's like some division in certain places. So we haven't spoke to them in about 12 years. 12 years and because of that it's, there's just never been a conversation I haven't got her number I don't know anything about her and I could speak to her but I feel in my heart I don't need to you know yeah. M maybe if the Lord brings it up then I probably would but I don't even know if she realized what she did and I know that's crazy to say because she's grown and she's old and it's crazy because I always get taken back to um Jesus on the cross and he said Forgive them for they don't know what they, they're doing. And that's like a tough uh, pill to swallow because you would think that, you know, yeah, like they know exactly what they're doing to Jesus. They're beating him, they're whipping him, they're spitting at him, but he's still saying on the cross, like, forgive them for they do not know. So I think my mindset is, even though that kind of traumatized me in ways, I don't think she knew. I, I, don't, I don't think she knew that there must have been a void area there. There must have been something that she didn't get. And, you know, my mind takes me to those places when it comes to people. They act like that because something happened to them. They act like that because they didn't have enough love. And so I don't, I don't blame her. I, I, I don't. Now, Otis, you are in America right now. I am, yeah. A long way from home. A long way from home. Uh, talk to us about that. How did you get here? What got you to come over here? I think that's an interesting part of your testimony. Yeah. Um, how, how, how did that happen? Yeah, so how I'm here is when I was, I think I was 21, 2019, 21, 22, I was on this path to be a professional soccer player. That was the path. That was the goal. Uh, my apostle back home prophesied and said to me, you're going to go to America uh, in August. I think it was 2019. And I did. And I thought solely it was going to be for football, soccer. Sorry, I'm getting confused. So I came. I was I was the best player on the team. Uh, I got a chance to be captain and two months in, I was already having conversations about how you can become a professional uh, soccer player in America. I had coaches, I had scouts, I had directors, our football clubs coming and speaking to me. So I thought, yes, like this is the, this is the goal. I'll glorify God in this field of soccer. Like this is the goal. And uh, as soon as I had an opportunity and a professional club came in for me, COVID came and the director spoke to me and said, listen, because of COVID now, the funds have dropped. Uh, th there's no way we can have you in because the whole uh, country's on lockdown. So I was just there like, okay, God, okay. You know, it came right onto my lap, but then it went. So I had to wait, I had to go back to England. And uh, when I was going back to England, uh, I was there for Christmas and I was going to go back to America, go back to my trial and we was going to start again. But then I found an app called Clubhouse and Clubhouse was obviously popping at the time. And uh, this is where I met uh, my leader here in America, um, uh, Prophet Jordan Bryce. Um, he was on Clubhouse and he was, I think, prophesying and stuff. And, you know, I clicked the, the link and I thought, okay, let me, let me stay on for a bit. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, come on in two hours time. Like he gave me an exact time. It was like 5.55 a.m. my time, come on. So I was like, okay, so I left. And I came on at 5.55. As soon as I came on, Prophet Jordan brought me to the stage and he just prophesied my whole entire life as they do. Prophesied my whole entire life. You know, he even got people to sow seeds in me and he told me, I don't know what you're doing in England because I see you in America. In my head, I'm thinking, yes, for football, I'm coming back. I'm going to do what I need to do. <laughs> but let did I know God was about to shift my plans. So um, what happened after that was I started to have dreams about Prophet Jordan. And I was like, why am I having dreams about this man? Let me hit him up. So I hit him up and I said, after our conversation and you prophesied to me, I just can't get it off my mind. 
And he said that he had a dream about me the same day that I actually hit him up. And he was like, okay, so I, what I want you to do, if you feel like this is God and if you feel like meant to connect, I want you to fast for seven days, just water, and ask for three signs. I said, bet. So I fasted seven days, asked for three signs. One of the signs were to, when I was in America, to play sports, you have to be at a university. So the first sign was for the university to tell me they do not want me to come back. I want them to find a reason because if this is you, God, you are going to make them find a reason. So that was the first sign. The second sign was for me to have another dream about me being with Jordan in America. And the third one was uh, me telling my mom and my mom being completely okay that I was about to go to another state in America and, and be with a stranger in their ministry. Day one of the fast, email from the university. We're sorry to say that because of financial reasons, uh, we don't want you to come back. Um, but maybe in the years to come, you can come back and study. Whoa, day one already, yo. Okay, God, okay. That's that's one sign gone. Day three, I had a dream of um, me and Jordan. Everywhere Jordan went in the dream, I was just doing the exact same thing he was doing. And then the third sign of me asking my mom, I asked her and she was like, do you feel like it's God? And I said, yeah. She goes, well, go. I thought, wait, what? Like, whoa, okay, this is crazy because, yo, my mom is a bit like, uh, who is this person? What's going on? But all three signs were answered. So then it was all about me getting here, all about me getting here. And uh, Prophet Jordan made it happen. And uh, I guess, yeah, now I'm in the States. I've been in the States since last year, um, April. And um, because of visa stuff, I'm going backwards, forwards, backwards and forwards. But you know, one day we're hoping and uh, hoping for God that it'll be an opportunity for me to just stay here because I believe I'm called mm. to America. Well, I know I'm called to America. So, Can you share with us your testimony with uh, uh, encountering the Lord Jesus? Yeah. Um, you have multiple encounters, but if, if you don't mind, I would love for you to share that. Yeah, sure. So, so this is how I knew I was called to America in the first place, even when I was playing football and church and stuff. Um, I, I fell asleep, I went to sleep and I had a dream that I was- And how old were you at this time? I was, I was 21. I was 21, yeah. I was 21 at this time. Um, again, I had, I had no desire, no, no attachment to America. I didn't want to go, not for any reason. I just wanted to make it as a footballer in England. But one night I was taken into a dream and I remember I was taken out of my body as I went to sleep and all of a sudden, I'm sh I've shut up all the way into like the universe. I see the earth uh, in front of me, and I see these gigantic, big feet, legs like, standing in the earth, and I'm just there, fearful, because I recognise that okay, this is a this is a spiritual being, and then I never forget as I looked to my left, I saw Jesus walk to me. His face was white, his face was white, and he was in white. Well, he, I couldn't see his face. It was literally like a glow, like just a white light. And um, he told me uh, who he was. And I knew like uh, the best way you could describe it is was when you encounter Jesus, you just know. Like you're like, you're the creator, the, the, the son of God, the Lord of God, he's, he's there. It's like your body quivers, like you just know. And he comes over to me and he says, I'm sending you as a prophet to uh, the United States of America. And it was like, he took me onto the world and it was crazy because it was like, we was like now walking on the world. And it was like the ocean will come to our ankles and we're walking in the world. And he would like pick up America and he would show me about the power states of America. He would say, these are the power states of what are running the country right now. And I'm gonna send you as a prophet and I'm gonna send you into the government and I'm gonna send you as one uh, who will go in for my namesake. And this will be the start and the gateway for you. And I'm, I remember just being at awe because I remember him picking up the land and just walking in the ocean and stuff. And I was just at awe. But every word that he said was so sharp. I, I, I could not miss it. And um, I remember after, as soon as he said those words and he told me that he's sending me as a prophet and that's my gateway city. It's like I woke up. So that was my first time um, that I encountered uh, Jesus and how I knew spiritually that I was a prophet as well. Because... Before, you know, people have prophesied, you know, prophetic anointing, prophetic grace, your prophet. But spiritually, in that moment, now I know because Jesus told me he's sending me as a prophet. So that was my first one. My second one, 
I was into deliverance at this point. I'm all into demonology and deliverance and devils. And I started studying the marine kingdom and I was just so intrigued about how does this kingdom operate and how does it work and what does it look like? And I remember I asked God before I went to sleep, I said, Lord, I said, if there's any way, can you show me the marine kingdom? Can you show me the kingdoms of darkness and of the earth to show me, show me what I can't see? And I never forget, went to sleep. I was taking out my body again. And I was taking out my body onto this beach, beautiful white sand, beautiful blue ocean. And again, uh, Jesus again, white face, um, still there, uh, same appearance as when I saw him. Uh, his face was glowing like a, the brightest light, like glowing. And uh, his hand was out like this to me. And uh, I walked to him and I grabbed his hand. And he was walking me in the ocean. And at this point, I don't know what we're doing here. I don't know what's going on. But he walked me in the ocean. And as we walk him, we walk in the ocean. The ocean's going higher and higher. And then all of a sudden, it's like, bang, we shoot to a point in the ocean. We're going like 100 miles an hour, it felt like, into the ocean. And at that point, it, we just stopped. And then when we stop, he then shows me all these demons in the ocean. He says, this is, this is the smaller uh, demons in the ocean. These are the, these are the ones that are not as big and not as evil as the ones where I'm going to take you next. So these demons were like frozen. Their eyes could move left and right, but the bodies just could not move. And I was just there looking at these, at these demonic sea creatures that they look like just in the ocean. And they were frozen. And then he took me to the next place, grabbed his hand again, took me to the next place. And when I went to the next place, now these were bigger ones. And even the, the presence in this place felt darker. It really felt dark. Like this dark felt like tangible dark. It felt dark. And these were huge and big demons in the sea. And I was looking around. And I'll never forget, I must have been facing this way. And I remember I turned around and there was a demon right there. And I must have jumped. And fear tried to rise, but straight away got shut down because Jesus was with me. I remember looking at this demon and I was looking at it and it looked like, I always say it looked like Randall from Monsters Inc. It looked like a spitting image of Randall. But when I looked in this demon's eyes, it was like saying like, I want to kill you. Like, I hate you. Like, you feel that hatred in the eyes. It was just looking at me, staring at me. And he took me to the next part and it was like these working factories under the ocean um, where things were getting passed from one place to another in the ocean. And it was just a lot. And then eventually went back to the shore, walked me to the shore, I turned around to see if he was there. He was gone. Then I woke up. So that were the two times I've, I've um, seen Jesus. I haven't seen him <laughs> any other time. Wow. Yeah. What do you believe he's calling you to do? today like in this time now you're you said you're 26 well, I'm, tw I'm 24 i'm 24 25, sorry yeah. it's okay you're 24 yeah what is he pulling out of you right now where what does he want you to do obviously we know that you're you you're called to america um but where are you at with your relationship with jesus what i feel like god is doing with me right now it is definitely preparing me I've had dreams of me going to different governments and different kings. I've had dreams of me in the White House. I've had dreams of me with government officials, not just in America, but in different countries in the world. And I really believe that right now, God is just really preparing me. He's maturing me. He's killing me at the same time, denying everything, denying yourself. It's been a very humbling experience, a very humbling process. I really believe he's, he's just preparing me to take me into my next place. Um, you know, my, my abilities to prophesy and the giftings, the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom. And it's like all those things are increasing and increasing because I know that there's, there's going to be a time very soon that I'm going to be taken into my next place. Mm. Now, I don't know how or what that's going to look like, but I know that there's going to be another sending out. This is just like the training ground, the preparation. England was one, was stage one. Me being here was another level of maturity. And I just feel like God is really preparing me for the governments and the, the, the kings of, of this world. Because again, I've had multiple, multiple dreams about that. Otis, who is Jesus to you? Who is Jesus? I'll say this, and it's funny you ask that because even me growing up without a dad, he was always my father. I, because I never had a father, it was just so instantly, Father God, Father God, Jesus, Father, 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 Father. Because... I was now really affirmed by God. I was really affirmed as a son. Jesus is everything. There's not enough words to describe of 
what he is. He's he's my safe place, um, my my peace, my joy. Um, he's everything that I need. And this could sound cliche, but until you actually experience that truth, it really is that very thing. He's he saved me. I should be dead. You know, car crashes shouldn't be born. Um, all the things that happened to me, I shouldn't be here. But he he kept me, and it's like it, it blows my mind. Like why why me? Why any of us? Do you know what I mean? It's his grace, and like he he's just he's just everything. The one word I can say, he's just he's just everything. He's just everything. One way to ever make me cry is for me to ever just talk about the goodness of God because it it's so real. It's so real. So I don't even know if I've answered your question, but like he's 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 everything. He's legit. He's everything. Oh, does any last words for anybody who is watching your testimony, um, who's just connecting with with your journey, with the journey that you've been on? What are some last words that you can offer to them? <sighs> wow. Um, last words that I would say is don't count yourself out. Don't condemn yourself. You're not your past. You're not your issues. You're not your mistakes. A lot of people in this world judge people for where they go wrong. There are a lot of people in this world, like I was one of them, low self-esteem, always felt like I had to perform for man, always felt like I had to uh, be the, the funny guy, the, the one that everybody liked, uh, come out of my purpose and my calling to uh, accommodate man and please man. The, the beautiful thing about Christ that I learned and that everyone I hope really grab from this is regardless of where you came from, he can transform a caterpillar to a butterfly. And it's it's literally what he does all the time. The more messed up you are, is the more he just gets the glory out of your story. Mm. And that's all he wants. He just wants to get the glory out of your story. There's nothing too hard for God. The Bible already says that there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. And there's a lot of us, even like myself, when I got saved, I was still in cycles. I was still having sex. I was still uh, in masturbation. That masturbation even went to like a gambling addiction um, because it was like addiction after addiction. But even in that time, I am still here because of his grace. And it's like there is nothing that can genuinely separate you from the love of God. This is not just the word of God. Yes, it is. But it, it is truth and it is reality. So regardless of where you've come from, regardless of what you are still struggling with, if you are still alive, you're here for a reason and for a purpose. And I just want to encourage everyone who's listening or could hear this to know that if you are alive right now and you, you hear what I'm saying, is that God has a plan for you for tomorrow. He, he, he sees beyond your mistakes. He sees beyond your transgressions. He's the God of breakthrough. He's the God of miracles, signs and wonders. He will bring you through. So that's how I would leave encouragement is that, you know, God will bring you through. So, yeah. For people in Europe, the people who are living on that other side of the world and who are watching your testimony, what can you say to those believers mm -hmm who are maybe in a tough situation or who maybe are not finding the community that, you know, they may be seeing online or that they yeah. desire. What can you speak to the people in those areas? The best advice that I would say is uh, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered by the Lord. God is the, the God of the valley and of the mountain. There's times where you may feel like you are not in the right place, the right position. But if you just stay in the secret place, if you just really pray and really seek God, not just seek God when uh, you go to church or when you have that feeling, but if you genuinely seek God, he will direct you to where you need to go. Seeking God looks like reading the word, making sure you pray, not just for five, 10 minutes, but really uh, valuing God because you, you make time for what you value. When you learn to value God, God will really direct you into the places and into the positions where you are supposed to go. For those who have no hope, you have to understand that the Bible is our very hope. Jesus is our very hope. So you cannot let the enemy lie to you in your positions that you're in now because your position does not determine your purpose. It determines where you are now and it'll determine God will bring you from this state to another. He does it time and time again. So I would just say, read the Bible, have a prayer life, and you will see, even without a church, if there's some of you that don't have a church, if there's some of you that feel like you have no friends, if there's some of you that have just got saved and you feel like you've, you've left people behind and you're by yourself, the Holy Spirit is always there and he's always listening. He will bring you through. He really will bring you through. And I've been there, I've experienced it, and it's just about holding on. It really is just about holding on.